Last week, Joel and I visited with Father Stephen DeYoung and picked his brain about 1 Maccabees and the Old Testament in general. We continue today, and you're going to love what you hear. I'm Joel Miller. And I'm Jamie Bennett. And this is Bad Books of the Bible. It's a podcast about a collection of books with a curious pedigree and an even stranger legacy. What would you say that modern Christians can take from First Maccabees? Yeah, I, I think that it is um, important that we, we uh, take seriously the consequences of that trying to instrumentalize religion. A lot of times in the church, we think that, well, if we do things right, if we do things the right way, right, and if we maybe follow the right programs or sounding a lot better, you know, we're, mm-hmm. we're faithful to the liturgical tradition we have. If we just do this stuff, then that will make things happen, <laughs> right? The yeah. things we want to see happen, the things we want to accomplish, the things we want, you know, those will all happen if we just sort of do this right. And that's putting us in the driver's seat, yeah. right? So if we just do X, Y, Z, then our parish will grow and we'll stop having financial problems and you know everything everything will go great right. uh, even as 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 people we tend to think that way right well sure. if i just if i do my prayer rule and i get these and i go to church and i do this and that right then my life will all start going <laughs> correctly like i can make this happen yeah. i think that's an easy trap to fall in especially honestly in the orthodox tradition where there are so many things you can do And the assumption is, if I do them, something good must happen. I mean, it can't be for nothing, right? You know? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We turn prayer into something more like magic Mm -hmm. than like actual prayer. Um, And so uh, when we're doing all the things we're supposed to be doing, we are cooperating with what God is doing. But yeah. that doesn't make it something other than what God is doing, yeah. which he does as he determines mm-hmm. in his timing, right, as, as, as he sees fit, right? And so if, if what God is doing is allowing Judea to remain under foreign domination, the correct response to that is explore, right, what, what is it that Israel needs to learn from this, right? Where is the repentance that needs to take place, right? Uh, not how does, how do the Judeans step up and change this and make it better? Mm-hmm. What God brings into our life is we're told by scripture, right? Ultimately for our good, not necessarily yeah. pleasant, right? <laughs> or or for what would see we would see as good in the short term, but it is for our good. And so when those things happen, we're called upon to explore that, not to try to figure out the instrumental way to reverse it or change it yeah. right? or fix yeah. it or make it better. Yeah, it's the, the slaying of the elephant that still falls on you and crushes you. Yeah. That, <laughs> that is a really great picture. And that is exactly what, was it Gregory the Great who, who made that point? It's either that, him or St. Bede. One of, okay. them. one of them made that point that that was zeal, but it like ultimately backfired. And he's not a hero in that moment to the saints where he might be to us, like on a surface level reading of it, you know, our mind honestly goes first to Legolas at the, uh, you know, the final <laughs> battle in, in, uh, in uh, the, the final Lord of the Rings movie. And you're like, yes, here he goes. He's going to like tackle this <laughs> elephant. And uh, no, it falls on him. And <laughs> And that's, sorry, you know, thanks for playing. (laughs) Yeah. Wah, wah. (laughs) (laughs) One question from one of our readers, Luther, uh, listeners rather, Luther Menard um, asked, how should the Orthodox Church understand the canon and inspired books of scripture if different Orthodox groups have different canonical books? Part of what... um makes this difficult is that all of us in the West, regardless of what church we belong to, have a bad case of Protestant brain. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is um, one of the key differences between Protestantism and the rest of the Christian tradition 
has been the incredible emphasis on private reading of scripture. Mm -hmm. And that's not all bad. If you actually look where Protestantism has gone in the world, uh, literacy increases exponentially. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that was for the purpose of teaching people to be able to read the scriptures. So that is, is very much the emphasis. And so the, the collective reading of scripture in, in worship services and church services is sort of seen as an extension of that main and primary private reading of mm-hmm. scripture. And then related to that is memorization of scripture and, you know, with kids teaching them the basic stories and that kind of thing. Uh, but for the rest of Christian history before the Protestant Reformation and in the rest of the Christian world to this day, it's actually the collective corporate reading of scripture that is primary. And the private reading is an extension of that. The reason I would do the epistle and gospel readings every day privately is because for various practical reasons, I can't go to Matins and Vespers every day. <laughs> right? mm. um, if I was in an environment where I could, I would be hearing those within that corporate right, I- environment. And and, so, which sets the interpretive context for what I'm getting out of it, even if I am reading it privately. Right, right. And, and even if you're reading it privately, you're reading the same texts privately that all the other Orthodox Christians mm-hmm. in the world are reading privately on that day, right? So that very much re, or should reframe how we view the whole question of canonicity, right? Because if, if private reading is primary, then you're going to look at the canonicity question as, well, I have all these groups making claims mm-hmm. about what is and isn't canonical. Who should I believe? How do I tell who is right as an individual person, right? And you get these sort of weird things where people say, well, uh, it's self-attesting. Like you could just read and you can tell, right? (laughs) Nothing is self-attesting. Yes. (laughs) And they'll say like, oh, well, if you go read the quote unquote apocrypha, you'll see there's all this weird stuff in it, right? And let me tell you, there's nothing even half as weird in 1st Maccabees as a donkey talking (laughs) or an axe head floating, right? Right. If you're coming from a modern materialist perspective, First Maccabees is a pretty easy read compared to a lot of the (laughs) Old Testament that we all agree is canonical, right? So that whole self-attesting thing doesn't really work. And so there's a lot of confusion, right? And so uh, I I don't know that, that Luther said the question is a Protestant or even comes from a Protestant background, But that question comes from that kind of view of, I need to figure out what it is I should be reading and how I should treat it, right? Um, The question of canonicity, if we look at it from the corporate reading of scripture perspective, is purely an objective one and there's no confusion at all. Mm -hmm. Whatever community you're actually a member of has certain texts which they read authoritatively and preach and refer to in hymnography and interpret Right. And so those are the texts that are canonical for you. Right. Mm -hmm. Canon always exists within community. When we talk about uh, the Western canon, (laughs) right, we're talking about a group of texts that function in an authoritative way historically within Western European broadly culture. Right. Those texts aren't canonical in the same way in Kenya or China. Right. Because they haven't influenced the culture in that way. They don't perform that role. Right. So whatever Orthodox Church you're a member of, right, the the texts which they are using canonically are the texts which are canonical for you. So you're saying ask your bishop? (laughs) They go go to church. It can't be that simple. (laughs) I I remember when we interviewed uh, Dr. Amy Jill Levine and she responded to or mentioned at the start of our conversation about Tobit that she had canon envy. (laughs) She loves the book of Tobit so much. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it. So, um, you know, if, if you're, if you're a member of the Ethiopian church, then for you, the book of Enoch is read and taught and applied in this canonical way. And the book of Enoch doesn't function that way in a Greek Orthodox church or an Antiochian Orthodox church or a, uh, an OCA church. Yeah. 
you know, in, in your book, God is a Man of War, you talk about sin, uh, not so much like in legal or ethical terms, but you talk about it in terms of like a contagion, like an infection, epidemiology, right? We're all so, familiar with this now. I mean, yeah. We're all, we're all yeah, experts actually, in epidemiologists these days. I wrote that pro co- pre-COVID, but then when all this <laughs> happened and we were in the editing process, I was like, wow, this is going to be really timely. <laughs> extremely timely so i want you to like if you don't mind tell us a little bit more about that how it impacts our understanding of like the old testament means of dealing with sin and in particular i want to know does it tie in at all to words of conquest yeah so through a long chain that i won't rehearse here (laughs) of of western theology have have that begins with translating the word torah as law um come to see uh, sin as a question of violating rules, right? Violating statutes, right? Um, And then there's the whole construct of guilt that sort of then guilt attaches to the person who has done that. That guilt has to be repaid or suffered for or punished Mm -hmm. in some way. Um, But all that is really foreign to, to the Torah itself. That's not how it presents it. Uh, we were too big a discussion to talk about whether it's a valid metaphor, but sure. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not what the, the way the Torah speaks, right? So mm-hmm. the way the Torah speaks is that sin has this kind of ontological reality to it. Mm-hmm. It is a thing that is in the world and it, it infects and overpowers people. The first time the word sin is mentioned in the Old Testament is in Genesis 4. Mm-hmm. When God is talking to Cain. It's crouching at the door. Yeah, yeah. And the word that's translated crouching there is actually an Akkadian loan word that was used to describe this type of demon that they thought came up through cracks in the earth and sort of skulked around, <laughs> like looking, looking for people. So sin is sort of this force, right? And it wants to master Cain, but Cain must master it, right? And all the way through to St. Paul, St. Paul very rarely, on a few occasions, he'll talk about sins, plural. Uh, more often when he's talking about that kind of thing, he uses the word trespasses. Uh, but most of the time when he uses the word sin, it's singular. And he's using it in that kind of sense. This kind of force, this thing that's out there in the world, like COVID or the flu or the plague. right? <laughs> and it's out there. It's ready to infect people. Once it does, it will corrupt and destroy them. But it also leaves like a taint, like a residue. Mm-hmm. Right. And you have, we haven't been doing this with with COVID. But if you think about the plague, if you think about certain other diseases and epidemics where you have to go and burn all of that person's property, mm-hmm. you know, because it might be attached to it you know, yeah. and, and someone else might might be afflicted with it. That's sort of the way sin is seen. So, for example, on the Day of Atonement, you've got the one goat for Azazel where the sins of the people are put on it. That goat isn't sacrificed because now it's unclean. It gets sent out in the wilderness to take that sin away. But that's talking about sin as something, right? You Mm. can take it and put it on the goat, (laughs) right? Right. Um, And it can carry it away. But then also the, the blood from the second goat that is sacrificed as a sin offering, that blood is taken and used to purify the sanctuary, like the physical objects, in the sanctuary have to be rededicated and purified with blood, sort of the residue of sin. And it's not that um, there's a lot in scholarly literature, believe it or not, there's a huge debate about this, um, about whether the the sanctuary sort of collects the sin (laughs) residue, like a magnet, (laughs) um, if it like travels there somehow, but it's, it's not so much that it all collects or travels there as that that's the place where it's dangerous. Yeah, Mm -hmm. because that's the holy place. That's the place where God is, Mm -hmm. right? That's the place that has to be kept most pure, right? So this idea that sin taints the material world is basic to the Torah, and it's basic to uh, the language that's used in Joshua, that, that the abominations they're committing, particularly related to sexual immorality and idolatry, and shedding innocent blood. These things taint the land, right? That the land is tainted, and the threat that's given to Israel is that the land will vomit them out. 
right? Mm -hmm. If they, if they pursue these same things. And so that has to be purified, Mm -hmm. has to be purified. And that continues. This is, I mean, this is why we're always blessing things now, thankfully not with animal blood, because that would ruin (laughs) a lot of my vestments, but (laughs) with holy water. Yeah. Right. We bless houses. I tell people I've been asked, you know, why do you have to come every year and bless my house? I say, well, go a year without sitting in your house and I won't have to. Right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's, we have to purify and rededicate. We bless all these physical objects, people's new car, people's. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and and the idea is we're taking them out of the world and we're rededicating them for this new purpose. And we're cleansing them from that sort of taint that got on them out in the world. But even like, St. Justinian's Nomo Canon, uh, if you look at the language uh, talking about sexual immorality and idolatry, he uses that language of the land vomiting them out. Like he thinks that will happen to the, the Roman Empire if those things are allowed, uh, are allowed to go on. I mean, the way I have come to understand sin is informed by a Western tradition. And that looks like, okay, it's, it's this legal thing. I've unlearned that um, to the extent that we've talked about. But one area that I haven't unlearned would be Augustine's idea that sin is a privation, that it's not a thing. It's the absence of a thing. So how does that square with what you just mentioned? Yeah, the way I understand an absence of a thing, <laughs> right, which is something we can t- we can't understand nothing. Right. That's yeah. not that's yeah. something a human being can because even saying the word nothing, that's something. Right. Right. Uh, <laughs> that's. Um, is that it sort of has a parasitic existence. Mm, okay. Right? That it's it's parasitic on what is. Like decay or corruption, right? Isn't a thing. It's a word for a lack of a thing. I find a dead carcass. And when I talk about its decay or decomposition, even though I'm using a noun, what I'm really talking about is the parts of the living animal that are now missing. Right. There's, a, there's, something, there's something receding there. Yeah. And so um, this is a place where modern science helps a little with the the contagion analogy because a virus is not actually an organism, Mm -hmm. right? A bacterium is, but (laughs) a virus isn't, right? It's sort of Mm -hmm. a shred of something, you know? And so, yeah, so it's that idea that it's like, it's like parasitic and and destructive, right? Mm -hmm. Like gangrene or mildew is one of the most common actually metaphors in, in the Torah. That's why there's all those rules about getting rid of mildew. (laughs) <laughs> right? yeah. it's not that mildew is just a particular problem in the sinai desert right <laughs> it's it's that, it's that mildew is sort of being used as this representation or like mold on bread right like that it's it's this parasitic and destructive thing but that can be carried yeah. right it's kind of a spore to it wow get into lightning round territory here in a minute we've kind of covered this earlier at the top of the show but tell us about gigantomachy (laughs) yeah yeah what's going on with that word (laughs) (laughs) so so gigantomachy is one of uh these universals of the ancient world is that everybody thought there was one okay it's like sort of every civilization had a flood story Mm -hmm. that they they all had a gigantomachy story (laughs) right And so what we really have, going back to the definition of history, we have these competing stories and they're not competing over which one of these is most factually accurate, right? Like which flood story has the correct dimensions of the boat, right? That's not, that's not how they're competing truth claims. If if you are trying to build one to put in a theme park though, someplace (laughs) in middle America, you may need to know that. Like I said, peak (laughs) modernism right there. But uh, it's in that that more ancient view of history, right? Which of these is the story that tells us who we are, how Mm -hmm. we got here, and that then sets our trajectory for the future, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And so the Gigantomachy story, as it's found in uh, the books of Numbers through really 2 Samuel, David really brings an end to it. is a story of uh, the descendants of Abraham uh, being sent by God 
to uh, remove these these particular tribal groups that, as we said before, were were practicing these sort of abominable these sort of abominable things, right? So the giants in most other places, and when I say the giants, we're talking about people with the same names. So there's there's the Book of the Giants at Qumran in the Dead Sea Scrolls that lists the names of a bunch of giants. One of them is Gilgamesh. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in the, the competing stories, these giants were these ancient god kings, right? Who are part divine, part human, uh, sort of uh, exalted, right? Heroic beings, right? Whereas in, in the biblical story, they're these sort of tyrants who commit these atrocities and abominations who come under who come under God's judgment, right? Um, and so the 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 picture of the giant or the member of one of these giant clans, you know, Og, king of Bashan, who we keep singing about on feast days in Matins, uh, the Orthodox Church. Um, the 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 uh, the story of them is that this is the image of what demonized humanity looks like. Right? If Christ is our picture of divinized humanity, followed by the saints, then the giants are our image of demonized humanity, humanity that has become demoniac right? by, um, by bringing into the world the actions of demons, sometimes literally, sometimes we're talking about sorcery and that kind of thing, right? um, and, and these other rituals. So this is sort of the ultimate diminishment of humanity. Uh, these are sort of monsters as opposed to heroes. Uh, mm. And so that's that's sort of the key element in terms of how that story was supposed to be carried forward, as we mm -hmm. were saying. Mm -hmm. Right. Is this is this is the place where things can go when everything goes wrong. <laughs> right. When you follow that path, the path of sin, the path of rebellion against God all the way to its end, you end up like this well, you talk about the the challenge of a modern person reading these texts and even walking away with that understanding um when we do hear stories about for instance in genesis 6 about the yeah. uh, the angels desiring the the daughters of men um and then you know producing children like our mind immediately goes to what is how, how does that how does that play out with dna i mean how, like how does that work <laughs> right with which of course they didn't know existed, right? Yeah, <laughs> That's, they, had, they had no concept of genetics, yeah. And one of the problems with Genesis 6, 1 through 4 is that it's effectively ancient shorthand because it's referring to a set of stories that everybody knew. Mm -hmm. Every culture at that time had a version of this story where these rebellious divine beings gave knowledge to humanity that they weren't supposed to have that usually involved sorcery, uh, Warcraft, not the game, uh, <laughs> um, right? Uh, stuff related to seduction and sexual immorality, right? That these things were inspired by demons and produced these sort of these sort of demonized men, including sexual rituals, right? Og's bed is described its exact dimensions because we found a ritual bed in a ziggurat of those exact dimensions. So we know that this is telling us about Og's bed to tell us. He's one of these mm. people, right? Wow. Uh, yeah. Not just to say he had a he had a big big metal bed. Um, <laughs> so, but you know, the Greek version of this is Prometheus, right? Uh, and the Titans, right? And the the Babylonian version of this, they were called the Apkalu, the Seven Sages. But there's all versions of this. So Genesis six could just kind of allude to this because it's like a story everybody knows, right? right. <laughs> so you kind yeah. of all know what a, what we mean. But um, when you read the, the uh, Antonicene church fathers and you read some of the later Second Temple Jewish literature, they're pretty clear that this isn't talking about somehow an angel and a human just fornicating and having a baby. <laughs> it's, like half, it's like half and half, but that this is, um, they will explicitly talk about women being taught sorcery, mm. <laughs> right? And that it's it's this is happening in a ritual way a ritualized way right i right. think you point that out in in the book by pointing out that was gilgamesh who has essentially 
three parents. Yeah. Um, which, you know, also violates genetics, but makes sense if you're imagining there's two people and they are under the influence of a demonic spirit. Right, right. And one of the one of the early Gilgamesh stories says that his father was a phantom. Mm-hmm. Hmm. <laughs> so wow. that there was this sort of third, yeah, third party involved. And those kind of rituals are found all over the world, including the Japanese emperor still participates in one. Wow. When he becomes emperor, where he spends the night ritually with the uh, sun goddess. You could tell us why Elisha isn't a terrible person for sicking a couple of bears on a few dozen kids. <laughs> yeah. So the, the lightning round version is that uh, the word na'ar in Hebrew, that's what's translated children there. Um, is actually a much more complex word than that. Okay. It gets translated by 16 different Greek words in, oh, wow. in the Greek Old Testament um, in different contexts. So uh, sort of the core meaning would be a young man, but the most common use is actually for a young court official. Hmm. Sort of the equivalent of like uh, the way we would use young Turk. Um, hmm. Sorry, Greeks for saying that word. Um, <laughs> You know, sort of, sort of, uh, you know, your your freshman congressman kind of idea. <laughs> right? um, so this is this is, for example, how Daniel and his friends are described in Babylon, their role that they play. Okay, right. right. And there are a number of uh, Saul and David's fighting men who are described this way. They weren't child soldiers, right? They were, <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> yeah, sort of young officials. And, you know, we should take pause and think it's weird that Dan, that uh, Elisha is walking, you know, down this road and encounters this roving gang of children. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, in between cities. Shouldn't they be in school? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. But uh, yeah, so the idea is more that these are these young court officials who are part of Israel's monarchy. And when they say go on up, they're talking about the high place there. They were trying to force him to offer sacrifices hmm. to Baal, right? Remember, this is this period where the Israelite monarchy is, shall we say, deeply indebted to the Phoenicians. Uh, and, and so they're trying to force him. So this is the equivalent of basically a bunch of brown shirts running into this old man on the road. Yeah, these are ruffians. Yeah, trying to like <laughs> bully him and force him. And then God sends these bears out of the woods to protect him from them, mm. right? To rescue him from them. So it's a story about God's faithfulness to protect his people when they face this kind of institutionalized government persecution. Yeah. Wow. All right. Another lightning round question. Jephthah. What do we do with Jephthah? I remember hearing a pastor one time try to salvage his reputation by saying that in reality, Jephthah just offered up his daughter as a as a servant in the temple. That's what that that's what that yeah, passage yeah. means. Yeah, and so I've, I've heard that too. My first question is always, this is Judges, what temple? Um, <laughs> well, I guess the tabernacle. Yeah. yeah, but even then, right, wrong tribe, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, if he, if, I mean, there were shrines in high places that had women attached to them, but they were not like dedicated versions. Mm. Quite the opposite. It. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, if the idea is that that his daughter goes and becomes a nun, mm -hmm. uh, why would they have an annual festival of mourning over her becoming a nun? Sure. <laughs> like, right. <laughs> that seems an odd. I mean, Hannah didn't like mourn her, you know, <laughs> like her son going into. Um, and also, you know, he says, whoever comes running out to see me first. And by the way, it is whoever, not whatever. Right. That's another way the English tries to salvage it. Right. Like as if he thought a sheep was going to come running out to greet him that he was going to sacrifice. Right. Um, he probably thought more slave <laughs> than, than right. daughter. Yikes. But would he have taken his slave and, and <laughs> given them to be a, a servant in the. Right, right. So so those kind of dodges don't make sense. But also uh, there's no reason we have to say anything positive about Jephthah. Uh, yeah. There are precisely zero church fathers and zero Jewish rabbis who say anything positive about Jeff. <laughs> right. When they talk about that story uniformly, they say positive things about the daughter. Hmm. They usually compare the daughter to Isaac. 
in the story of the, the sacrifice of Isaac. Right. Um, and talk about her virtue and her obedience to her father, even unto death. Right. And they use her as sort of this type of Christ. Right. Not Jephthah himself. So Jephthah, if you read the whole story, is a deeply pagan person. Uh, in the battle scene that people usually don't read before this, he basically says to the Moabites, you know, hey, Yahweh gave us our land. Chemosh gave you your land. There should be like a record scratch in the background. Like, wait, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, that's, and and he's he's literally when he says, whoever runs out to meet me. I mean, this is something we see the Moabites do, for example. Right. right? I'm going to sacrifice a child. That's definitely going to get the gods to do what I want. Right. So he's right. offering that up as sort of a bribe to God to give him victory in battle. So. Yeah, Jeff, the not a good guy, daughter, good guy. And the, there is the interesting thing about that festival where they sort of all go mourn her mm -hmm. annually uh, is that that is one instance. This is like the Israelite version of a very common pagan festival that's all over in the ancient world. The one most people would have heard of would have been the story of, of Demeter and Persephone, right? The Greek version. But that was celebrated. In the mysteries of Demeter, they would go out with lanterns, like looking for, <laughs> right, the lost girl, the lost woman. I, I wonder, like, based on our conversation so far, I would say your take on First Maccabees is th this is actually something we should be reading more critically and with an eye towards, um, I, I like. Honestly, a discerning but negative even view towards the behavior of of the Hasmoneans of the of the Maccabean clan. And I wonder if what we see in our desire to read it more positively is actually the very same as the desire to kind of baptize Jephthah, um, which is we just don't want an Old Testament figure to somehow be bad. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that's how we're taught these stories in Sunday school. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. There's always a hero, right? Because that's a that's a, a common way for our culture to tell a story. There's a good guy, there's a bad guy. And yeah. you know, those of us who are adults now know reality is messy and there's just a bunch of guys, right? <laughs> like there's not always an identifiable, you know, the good guy is often compromised, and the bad guy sometimes has a reason for why he's a bad guy, you know. Yeah, and I've, so I've we, seen Cobra Kai, and I know that Johnny Lawrence really yeah. was, was mostly misunderstood. Oh, yeah, no, <laughs> no, uh, Daniel was the real bully the whole time. Um, <laughs> it's, um, yeah, so, so part of this is, and maybe this will be a segue, uh, for you guys, is that, uh, First and Second Maccabees really need to be read together, mm -hmm. because yeah. if you just read First Maccabees, we kind of do that default of turning the main characters into the heroes. Yeah, right. When you get to Second Maccabees, you see who the real heroes of that period were, and they're not the ones out wiping out towns. Right, yeah. <laughs> they're a yeah. mother and her children who stay faithful. They're, you yeah. know, an elderly man yeah. who stays right, and so and they, and they're the ones who are recognized in the Orthodox Church as saints. Yeah. Right. And, and so it's important to sort of read those in tandem. There's a dynamic going on there that's also sort of going on in, in First and Second Kings, where even though these are the books of the kings, all of a sudden it sort of diverges and we stop talking about the kings so much and start talking about Elijah and Elisha <laughs> right? yeah. for chapters and chapters and chapters. Right. Because, well, the kings, uh, you know, <laughs> right? but but here's where the faithfulness, here's where God's acting. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think, I think it's important to hold those intentions so that we can see that comparison. Yeah. Right. First Maccabees is like the annals of the Kings of Israel that we keep getting directed to yeah. <laughs> you know, in Kings and second Maccabees is like the actual books of the Kings. Finally, one last question. Um, what confidence can a modern, and by modern in this case, I just mean chronologically, can a modern Christian have in a traditional understanding of the Old Testament as it relates to modern, and now I mean philosophically or secular, views on both the ancient Near East uh, scholarship and contemporary sensibilities? You know, like we are moderns, we read the text, and we, we're going to have our immediate impulse when we see what we see. Right. And 
I think the biggest thing here is that we have, a, we approach the text in a fundamentally different way related to that modernism, right? So we read the text with a certain amount of suspicion mm-hmm. what, and we're trying to cover what really happened, right? What is the agenda here? What is being covered up? What is right, a whole hermeneutic of suspicion, right? To try to get at what's behind it as opposed, and that's the opposite of the earlier approach of the church's approach of listening to it, Hmm. right? So as modern people, we approach the early chapters of Genesis as in how and when was the world created? Yeah. How old is the earth, (laughs) right? We look at for, we come to the scriptures and we look for answers to our questions, Mm -hmm. Rather than coming to the scriptures and seeing what the scriptures have to teach us. Right. And so to me, the actual traditional reading is not the fundamentalist modernist reading. Right. Yeah. It's not, you know, creation science and Ken Ham. <laughs> right? uh, that's not the traditional reading. Right. The traditional reading is what is. What are the early chapters of Genesis teaching us about humanity, about death and its origin and its purpose, about sin and its origin and how it functions, about how the world came to be the way it is where we're all divided into different nations and different languages and different religions and different cultures and practices, right? Those are the things it's trying to tell us. And rather than listening to that, we say, well, okay, yeah, but here are my questions. I'm Father Stephen Dio. I'm Jamie Bennett. And I'm Joel Miller. And you've been listening to Bad Books in the Bible. A production of Ancient Faith Radio. Come back next time when we unfortunately do not follow Father Stephen DeYoung's advice to read 2 Maccabees, but instead pick up the wisdom of Solomon. We'll be coming back to 2 Maccabees soon. This so, is why Monty Python always went from one sketch into another. They could never figure out how to end one. <laughs> <laughs> they just launch straight into the next one.